All right, welcome to another episode of Let There Be Talk. This is episode number 742 on the Monday, March 25th. I'm out here in New York City getting ready to do some shows for a few days. I'm at the stand, I'm at the cellar tonight and tomorrow night. So come on down if you're in town. And also, I want to give a good shout out to Standard and Strange, which is my favorite store in New York City. I will be heading over there today to see what they got and see my buddy Neil and Jeremy. StandardandStrange.com, your one-stop shop for all of your denim, leather, and boots needs. Japanese high-quality products. You know, I'm talking about the real McCoys, Y2, uh, Momotaro denim, John Lofgren boots. Oh, man. Everything in there. Check it out. Standardandstrange.com. Hope you guys are doing good. And uh, hope you had a great weekend. I've been out on the road nonstop here. Working. And uh, telling jokes. Feeling good, and uh, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you so much. Also, want to welcome a brand new Patreoner to the show, Chris Doherty. Thank you for joining my Patreoner, and also Stanley Stanley. Two names, both Stanley. <laughs> welcome to the Patreoner. Patreoner. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. You want to join the Patreon? I just put up another bonus episode. And uh, on that bonus episode, I dive into, what do I talk about on that? The new Black Crows record. I talk about old school Benji the Dog movies when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting edgy on you. And my six year anniversary of being passed at the Comedy Cellar, which was yesterday. Uh, March 24th, six years ago. Wild. Anyway, check that out. Bonus Let There Be Talks, 154 of them on Patreon. Today I sit down for a very rare, uh, something I don't do a lot on Let There Be Talk. I don't have people back that much because usually I have them on and we cover kind of their body of work. But there's few people on over the years uh, that have done it two, three times. And this is a, uh, a man who has done it. This is his third time, Mr. Neil Francis. And I think back to years ago when I first heard Neil Francis, I was blown away and had him on the podcast years ago. His story is insane. He had hit rock bottom on drugs, lost his band, Moved into a church in Chicago, was playing B3 Oregon um, at the the Sunday and, what, Thursday, whatever those things are called, the church gatherings. What is that? The ceremonies, the uh, congregation, I don't know, congregation, whatever it is. (laughs) I don't know much about church because when I was growing up, I know that my mom would make me go so she could just get me out of the house for a little bit. And, uh, oh, man, it just bugged me. And then she just knew, I I, I can't go there anymore. And we weren't religious at all, so I was like, "Why why am I going if you're not going, Mom? Anyway, his story blew me away. Years ago, 2019, he released a, a record with a song called Changes that just blew my mind. And his whole record blew my mind. And we became really good friends. And it was just so fucking bizarre. Because I had him on the podcast. And then a couple years later, we're touring around America together with Marcus King. The three of us out there. All three of us met through podcasting and music. And there we were. Doing 33 shows across America. I absolutely love Neil Francis. I love his music, and I just love everything about him. We, he's one of those people that 
I really hit it off with. And we could just talk music and life, everything for hours. His uh, album from 2021, In Plain Sight, is out there. But we sat down and we really uh, dug into the newest uh, project that he released, Fran- Francis Comes Alive. Don't forget about his uh, 2022 record, Sentimental Garbage. This guy puts out records. But we talk about his live record out right now that is just an incredible, incredible record. Francis Comes Alive, a little spin on Peter Frampton's Comes Alive, of course. And uh, it was a huge thing that he filmed and recorded. And it was just awesome to uh, see that. He's going to be doing the full Francis Comes Alive one more time out at Bonnaroo. Anyway, I love the guy. And I want you guys to check out his music. If you have not heard the first two episodes, we did one years ago on Zoom when he was living in Chicago. We did the second one on the tour bus somewhere in America on the tour last, what, a year and a half ago or something. And then we did this one at my house. He's in town recording a new record. This guy writes and records all the time. He is the real deal, man. He's not one of those people that just throws on a fucking costume and wants to be a star. This guy lives and breathes music. And man, he was killing it on the Marcus King tour. There were nights where Marcus, myself, and him were all singing. And it was just so much fun. I love you, brother. And uh, I love all you guys. Thank you for supporting the podcast. I'm going to say this one more time. I've been saying it over the last few weeks, and it seems to have been working. Please leave a review uh, of the podcast on iTunes. There's thousands of you listening. If you just take a minute to leave a review, it really fucking helps the show. And I got some new ones there. Let's see here. Let there be talk. You punch it in. You go to iTunes and then you check out the fucking reviews, buddy. Here's some reviews. I'll read a couple just because they're pretty fucking cool. Uh, my Myself came upon Delray with the Dark Fonzie thing years ago. Then proceeded into his own personal podcast episodes and fell in love with it. I enjoy everything about Dean and what he does and represents himself. Thank you for everything, Dean Del Rey. You rock, my friend. There you go, right there. That's from Smitty Man, 1970s. Let's read one more right here. Best music podcast, hands down, from Nimble Nine. Great interviews with great guests. Rock on, Dean. Dean not only knows music, he knows the music-making people. There you go, man. It's that easy. Just go to iTunes and leave a review. And also, while you're at it, subscribe to my podcast on YouTube. Tour dates are at deandelray.com. Lots of tour dates coming up. The Greek, June 8th in Berkeley. Belco Arena, two nights in Denver with Bill Burr. A uh, run at the Comedy Cellar in Las Vegas, July 8th through, I don't know, the 17th or something. And then I return back to Acme after the fucking mystery illness. And that is July 27, 8, 9 or something like that. It's on the website. I don't know what the... But it's in July. I return back to Acme. Candles lit, my friend. I love you, Neil Francis. Thanks for coming by and doing the show. Can't wait to hear the new record. And uh, thank you guys for tuning in every Monday. Candles lit. Neil Francis. All right. Here we are. Another episode of Let There Be Talk. This is a rare, rare thing on Let There Be Talk. A three-time visitor. A three-timer. You've been on three times. Yeah, man. Yeah. Remember, when did you do it? For, oh, you were living in Chicago. Yeah. And it was during COVID, right? During the Pando. Fuck. And then on the road with Marcus. Yeah, we did in that. In the tour bus. Yeah. And now here. Yeah. Los Feliz Live. The uh, new headquarters 
Yeah, new headquarters for the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Fucking great to see you. You're out here working on a new record, right? We're working. It's just it's just me out here with uh, Sergio Rios, our producer. Is it an album, an EP? What are you working on? It's a full record. Wow. How many yeah. songs? Man, I got like 18 songs, but we're probably going to release, release maybe half that. Right. So, Were you writing those when we were on the road together? Yeah, I mean... We had been touring pretty consistently for like two and a half years. And so every time I was in between, I was just going for it. How's the writing process? Do you write on the piano or guitar or what? It depends. I, I, us- I mean, I always write on piano, um, but the situation is just kind of dependent on like, you know, whether I'm collaborating with someone. Sometimes I'm doing like a full blown demo with all the instrumentation and i play everything myself in those instances this time around your band members are going to play on the record right yeah and they were on the last one too so it's the same guys i have on the road with me and then they were on the uh the last ep and the last studio album so since i saw you i mean we did that that two-month tour and uh you know you have been touring and myself, yeah. the entire time, there's not really any downtime with a an artist these days. Well, you do three many, three times as many shows as I do, but... <laughs> but still, like, it's like you don't work, you don't eat. Right. That's you know, there's no money from record sales. Yes. So it's all live money. So yeah. it's hard to say no to gigs because you're like, well, shit. Exactly. Right. And that's... This year... We're not doing very much because, you know, we're in between records. It's still the same cycle, you know. It's, we, you kind of have to have new material, even as a um, kind of in response to that model where, like, you're providing a live experience. And so just by virtue of wanting to present something different every time you go back um, as, as like, um, you know, part of the agreement with your fans is that it's not going to just be the same old song and dance every time you go back. Yeah. That's the same with comedy. Right. I bet. Yeah. Like I just did a venue this weekend, uh, Fort Collins come and you know, half was new, but half was old because there's that weird fucking fine line where people are starting to find you mm-hmm. and you're like, well, I don't want to go do a new hour. We got a bunch of people here. You want to see that, the greatest hits and Well, no, I haven't seen you yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And so you're like, "Well, I still I still want to do this stuff." A couple bangers in there. Yeah, so yeah, and you know, eventually you want to get the other stuff uh as big as that. But it, you know, and also I was shooting some of it, so I was like, "Well, let's shoot some of the old stuff." Mm-hmm. And and there's a ton of people there that are just finding me just like you. Uh, over the last couple of years, they're starting to find you, and they find you from like you know your records, and they want to hear those tunes. Sure. So you got to play the old stuff, and that stuff is really polished too. So we know it's going to hit, and it's like, you know, we got that in the can. Yeah. But then, you know, do you ever go to a club and kind of treat it as like a workshop? Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Well, You're like I'm just going to do new stuff tonight. A lot of what I do is. Open with uh, like something I know is going to work really good mm-hmm. for about 10 minutes and then just switch into new shit for a while yeah. and start working it out on the road. Yeah. Because the more I do it, the better it gets. And if you don't do it, if you have that fear of not doing it, you never grow. Right. And then you're like, well, what am I doing out here? You know, I, I, I want to get, I want, you know, if I go somewhere for a weekend, I want to get the new stuff in there even if it's not doing good i know i could just like you you could just throw one of your hits in right and get the crowd back dancing yeah it was tricky for us just having uh such a busy schedule you know um there wasn't really like a lot of energy or (laughs) even time to just rehearse in between tours so any any new stuff we added was just like, all right, we got to commit this sound check to brushing up on this one, you know? And so that's how we would prepare covers and new tunes and everything on this record we're doing is like brand new. Um, there's only a few instances we've ever played any of this stuff live. So, Oh, wow. Yeah. 
Now, let me ask you, since I saw you last, you did the Francis Comes Alive, mm-hmm. and you did a full, what was it, 11-piece band, and you filmed it and recorded it, right? Yeah, yeah. And you did that in Chicago. Yep. Let's go through that, because uh, that became uh, pretty pretty successful. People really like it, and it looks beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, man. Um, I'm really proud of it. It was like huge team effort, and uh, I had this, this is going to get a little woo-woo, um, but you know, to your California audience, they won't they won't be uh, offended. But it's I, I was like in this like breath work ceremony where I was literally on some sort of a psychedelic plane as a result of this forty minute breath work thing I was doing. Is that that guy uh, on on YouTube? What's his name? Wim Hof. Yeah, it's. I don't know what he does in comparison to this because I haven't really checked out his stuff. Right. But the guy who ran it was like, you know, there's a a lineage about trying to achieve this altered state through breathing, um, you know, without any sort of plant medicine or what have you. And um, as a result of this experience, I saw a vision of what ended up being the concert, you know. And so I came, came out of that, like came back from this retreat I did. And I was like in a total manic state. And I just went to my manager. I was like, we got to do a huge band. Because prior to that, we knew we wanted to do a live record. But it was, I was going to like play it conservative. I was like, we'll just do the four piece. You know, we won't really do any new material. We just like, I want to get it right. And then, you know, I came back from this weekend. I'm like, nah, man, like go big or go home. You know, we're going to have, everything's going to be coated in like white and black and it's just going to be insane and he's like all right cool like you've sold me but like how are we going to do this <laughs> you and know? how are you going to pay for it exactly and it was you know two months until the the concert which is it it ended up coming out really well just because um the director alec bassey who i've done four music videos with at this point you know he has great vision and a great talent for like taking a concept that was pretty abstract when I presented it to him and interpreting that and then being able to source materials um, economically, et cetera, you know, and uh, he hired his crew. I hired a lot of, you know, old buddies uh, for the audio crew and the band was all people I've played with, you know, over the last decade in and around Chicago. So it was a real kind of like a family experience, which was sweet. And what was the venue? Uh, it's called Talia Hall yeah. in Chicago. And what's, what did it hold? It's a thousand cap. Oh, that's and cool. Sold out two nights, which is two really, nights. really great for me. Holy shit. Um, and it, it was right down the street from my apartment, too. So, like, second night, I just walked. It was, it was like, the coolest thing ever, man. You know, just um, being able to walk to the theater. And that was a great gig, you know. But, yeah, every, everything we... Um, we recorded everything to two inch 24 track tape, including a dress rehearsal that took place, you know, the night before we started the shows. And so we had like five hours of audio and I sat and listened to all of it the Monday after the shows. And, uh, we ended up using all of night two. So everything you see in here is from. Wow. One shot. Yeah, man. That's cool. Yeah. Now, was the two inch? Was it a uh, like a mobile truck, or somebody bring in a, a two we inch? We brought in the machine, yeah, and we brought in uh, a mixing console and. Some, was it like a Studer machine? And it wasn't a Studer. It I'm trying to remember what tape machine it was. It might have been a Tascam. And uh, then, how many rolls of tape? Because they're fifteen oh, minutes yeah. each, right? No, we weren't recording at thirty ifs. We were recording at fifteen. Oh, ifs. so you had thirty. Yeah, yeah. So we had uh, probably ten reels. Damn. Yeah. Now, how would you do that when you came down to the end? Would you you be like talking while they changed the reel real quick? Yeah. So we actually had to stop the show. Yeah. And they made this like (laughs) sign that said tape change (laughs) with like a little uh, reel to reel uptake reel on it. And they just like held that out to the audience. That's fucking cool. Yeah. And then uh, Alec was able to work that into the movie too. Because that was like, that was something we were proud of, you know, because it's not something it's on many tape. people do anymore right and it just like even right after the show we'd be listening to what we just recorded and just faders up across the mixing console it just sounded like a record oh, right away that's cool you know? 
which is what I love about tape, and that's why I'm still making records that way, even though it's kind of like every time I go back to doing it, I'm like, is this is this how I should be doing things? And then I like I listen to it, I'm like, yeah, this sounds rad. Like, yeah, there's no yeah. way around it. So I'm still a tape guy. You know, it's fun. It's interesting. France has come to live. Uh, a play on obviously Frampton comes alive, yeah. which is one of the probably the one that really kicked everybody into doing live records. I mean, we had the Allman Brothers live at the Fillmore stuff, sure. but the Frampton comes alive became this format where bands. It was weird, like Kiss alive, Frampton comes alive, um, ACDC if you want blood. A uh, cheap trick, uh, you know, live at Budokan. These were all records that spring loaded these bands' careers mm -hmm. when their studio albums were really just kind of laying dormant. That was definitely true for Frampton. Of course. I mean, Frampton, came, Frampton Comes Alive was uh, one of the top selling records of all time. Um, I think until like Thriller overtook it. But yeah. that was like a long time. A th down the road. Thriller, Back in Black, and, Eagles' uh, greatest hits. Eagles' greatest hits, of but course. But still, Frampton Comes Alive is yeah. still in their top ten. I'm, I'm, I'm going to see him this year. Finally, I've Sweet. never seen him. Sweet. And uh, is he's he pl playing at the at the uh, Greek? Oh, okay. Yeah. Because that the uh, Frampton Kim Comes Alive was at the Marin County Civic yeah, Center. Yeah. Right. Right. Which and, is a Frank Lloyd Wright. Yep, Frank Lloyd Wright, yeah. and I saw many concerts in there. Nice. And um, including like... How big is that room? It's small as shit. Like I don't know. 3,000? I think it's 3,000. Okay. Yeah. It, uh, it is a crazy building. Blue roof. Mm -hmm. And next to it, it is... It goes across a, a highway too, right? It, no, no. Well, next door is like the Marin County um, courthouse, courthouse okay, and yeah. the jail and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole thing is just Frank Lloyd Wright. Mm -hmm. You know, like... Growing up in the Bay Area, you'd drive by it every day on the way to work. You'd be like, look at that kooky building. <laughs> yeah. It's just wild. So he cool. did part of it there, and I think he did part of it somewhere else, San okay. Jose or something. I can't remember. I didn't know that. But he, uh, you know, he really was the blueprint of everybody. And, and it was interesting that here you would have the same songs, Do You Feel Like I Do, mm -hmm. and Show Me The Way, and stuff like that, on a studio album and I couldn't even tell you the last time I listened to a, a Frampton studio album. Well, no, and that's what I heard growing up on the radio was the live version of Do You Feel Like We Do. Of course. And just, like, the way they incorporated the crowd into the vibe, you yeah. know, very subtly. It's, you know, they had... You could tell that they had a lot of control from an audio standpoint because it still sounds like a very, you know, 70s, warm, kind of, like, studio sound plus a little bit of room verb plus you can hear like the crowd going ape shit when he starts you know ripping that solo at the end talk like, box you know the the keyboard solo is great on that too yeah you know, just that like, guy just passed away i, uh, I believe bob marley bob marley bob mayo or Ma bob mayo man bob, bob mayo yeah. bob mayo i always thought he was saying john mayo uh, when i was growing up <laughs> yeah was john like, mayo <laughs> what john mayo is like a great <laughs> jazz keyboard player like yeah shit um, but yeah, um, that was pretty influential. And so it was a joke, obviously, at the beginning where we were all just like, oh, we got to call this Francis Comes Alive. Yeah. And yeah, maybe we should, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then oh, yeah. And Peter Frampton ended up catching wind of the whole project because uh, my good buddy Tom Cusimano um, is connected with Peter. And he was like, hey, man, check this out. Because the. Uh, big paper in chicago the sun times did a story about the shows yeah and he like sent him the link he's like oh wish neil all the best of luck you know congratulations and i was like i got that text the day of the first show so i was wow. like all right you know yeah <laughs> yeah we got sweet. we got a, we, we got, got a got blessing a... from and Peter also Frampton we need to fucking yeah. kill it because because <laughs> <laughs> if it didn't kill you, you'd be like oh, look at these dicks yeah, these francis <laughs> comes alive you're you're doing a spin off the greatest fucking right i know that's what that was what was you know scary about doing that too because you know if you fuck it up you look like an asshole so yeah you know i think we did it all right you know so it came out and now you're going to do Bonnaroo, which we talked about your first time you went to Bonnaroo. You were 17. Mm -hmm. You had a backstage pass. 
and you're back there just drinking beers going crazy it was like tool and police yeah. and uh, the roots and yeah. just a killer and now all these years later you're going back you're playing bonnaroo and you're bringing this francis comes alive lineup and you're gonna do it yeah man it's uh it's a dream come true to play at bonnaroo and we were supposed to do it i think we were booked in 2020 and then oh. we were booked in 2021 and that one got rained out I don't know if you remember that, but mm. like, um, I do remember that. So this is like a long time coming, you know, and we've been really excited about it. And so to be able to present the eleven piece there, which will be the ele- it'll be the last big band show for a while, because um, you know I'm gonna present that concept again with new material. But as far as the Francis Comes Alive band, this will be the last time we do it. So it's gonna be really special. Now, since I uh, toured with you, it was Marcus King, myself, you, and... Uh, Ashlyn Craft. Ashlyn Craft. Yeah. Yeah, Ashlyn Craft uh, out on the tour. One thing I've noticed about you, and I wanted to ask you what your thoughts on it, is you have seemed to climb to this headliner status now in a good kind of... Uh, you know, I would say five to a, a thousand, maybe a little bit bigger, headlining all over and and selling them out. Mm-hmm. And what do you think? There's multiple things to get there, but what do you think's really helped? Word of mouth, social media, the music. What's, what, what do you see is the real key? I really think it was... You know, our commitment to touring as heavily as we did right. and actually getting in front of people. Um, and then obviously presenting the music uh, at, you know, the, a high level of like execution was essential to getting people to spread word the of word. mouth. Right. right. So like, because, you know, we never had we never had a big hit song like, you know, our uh my last studio record had a couple tracks that were getting play on AAA radio. Changes. Right. But no, that was even... Um, Changes did really well uh, streaming and also on like college radio. Right. And then when we released In Plain Sight, I had a couple tunes like Problems and Can't Stop the Rain oh, yeah. that started getting circulated on like AAA radio and um, like satellite radio stations. But, you know, I never had like... Um, a big hit in those spheres and also just um, there was never like a big social media moment where like a lot of bands I know you know will just have something go viral on whatever platform you know and that's a that's a great boon to their success but it's just been you know kind of brick by brick for us and I feel like that is um, it's a good key to longevity just because you know those people are there for the thing that we're providing, you know, the live experience. Yeah, it wasn't like viral when you go viral a couple there weeks for later. The one song, yeah, somebody you know. else goes viral a couple weeks ago and they, later and they forget about you. Yeah, it's so just like, you know, those, dopamine hits. I'm not going to, you know, turn down that viral moment. Of course. Like, it's, it's gratifying to know that you can still just beat the pavement and chip away at it and succeed because that's really the, the only idea we had <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's just it's like all right guys get back in the van let's go and you know it was a long tour i mean you know i i'm only asking because i understand it's it's amazing when you see the word of mouth working because in this add world it's so weird where you could go kill somewhere let's say you killed which you were every night open for marcus but then people leave and they don't even remember the next day. Right, right, right. That's a weird fucking thing where they're like, you were incredible. We're at the merch booth, yeah, yeah. you know? And then the next day they just go about their life. Yeah, and man. that's an interesting animal. I don't take it for granted, you know? It's, uh, it's a pretty unique uh, thing that I get to you know, devote my life to music this way. You know, I haven't... I haven't worked a straight job in years, you know. So yeah, and, and, let, cool. and let's, if you haven't heard his first episode on here, basically had uh, burned it all the way down to the ground with <laughs> drugs and alcohol. And uh, and was, your first band was just done. 
and you've kind of risen and you're still clean yep. and you still got the band members and you're writing like crazy and you're getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, man. That's, you know, we're just, as they say, one day at a time. You yeah, know, just, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Clocking in at the studio and just, you know, I got to put my blinders on and just focus on, because dude, I mean, you know, I'm just like everybody else in terms of, you know, comparison, becoming distracted by what other people are doing, yeah. you know, kind of like, should I be going after this, you know, X, Y, Z, and every, you know, word of wisdom going back 3,000 years or whatever, you know, like the length of recorded human writing is just like, no, just stay in the moment. Yeah. Do what's in front of you. I th- yeah, I think you just got to do what you love to do. And if right. it hits, it hits because I- I'm the same way. I'm out there and and I can't really look at other people. Every You know, as they say, as cliche as it sounds, is everybody has their own path or journey. Mm-hmm. And if you're enjoying what you're doing, then who cares what's happening? Yeah. And to me, I always am just... All I want to do is work. I want to do the thing. Mm -hmm. So that's my fear. Because if I can't do the thing, I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, you can do your thing at home. You can record. You can be in a studio. With me, if I can't get gigs, I can't just do comedy. You know what I mean? On on Zoom with no one. Hey, comedy here, you know? (laughs) So... That is the only... Uh, Unless you're like recording skits or something. Right, or like, right. Well, know. that's different. Yeah, go man on the street, you yeah. know, doing, doing uh, you could pranks. You wear a wig and like make a video with yourself playing two characters. Right, that's right. You can do all that shit, but that, the energy that I love uh, of the audience with stand-up oh, yeah. is what, why I get up every day. That's what, you know, that's what I'm after too. Yeah, you know, exactly. The first time I played piano in front of my family at like a christmas party and everybody was clapping for me and all of a sudden i was important and you know validated and it's like you're still chasing that in some way yeah yeah i i said it on a podcast recently little league Mm -hmm. was probably the first time i was performing sure you're up there and you get a hit and they're like yeah yeah i didn't have many opportunities to be uh praised in my little league career but right you know yeah, yeah. That's but, why I stuck with piano, you know? Cause. Well, the thing with Little League, though, it really sets you up for also failure. You strike out. Yeah. You're stuck. <laughs> it's like when a joke doesn't work, I go, I ah, struck out tonight, you yeah, know? Yeah, shit, well. That's why the, the term striking out happens with anything. Dating. Yeah. Uh, you know, comedy, music, whatever. It's like, ah, I struck out. Yeah. It's the first... I think the first, that's why I fucking laugh at these fourth place trophies. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you're not, you're not setting them up for fail, you know, letting them, uh, you know, take in failure. Participation award. Yeah, that's fucking lunacy. Yeah, but if you're a kid, you know. You know. If you get the fourth, fourth place t- trophy, you're hiding like, that. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know it ain't shit. So. Yeah, yeah, you're putting that fucking. In the back of the closet. There's shame going around for the kids, all right? Nobody's mounting up in their house a fourth place trophy. (laughs) What's that? Oh, Billy. Yeah, Billy, fourth place. My son went fourth place. Although, you know, guys like Kurt Vonnegut would frame their rejection letters. Yeah. You know, that's kind of a a good motivator sometimes. But I think. He might have started doing that, you know, after, after he got. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are the. Um, there's two different ways to look at that. You could put it up and just be surrounded by your failure. Yeah. Or you could put it up after you get As successful. You, yeah, and be like, there you go. Remember that? Yeah. Remember that? That's why a lot of people like you see the Academy Awards last night. I was watching it. You know. There's Robert Downey Jr., you know, and he's just kind of like holding the trophy like, fuck all, you know. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't hire me. Christopher Nolan gets me. He brings me in. And look at this, you yeah. know. I'm one of the best, and you want one of the best, but you're also going to get some fucking lunacy. You know, artists are lunatics. Yeah. And then when they become lunatics, then the industry's like, well, I don't know. He's hard to work with. Well, that's because he's fucking real. Yeah, man. He's the real deal. Yeah. Yeah, I like Robert Downey Jr. He's great. I, I read a Rolling Stone article that was, you know, it was just an interview of him one day when I was recently sober. 
And he's like, man, at this point, if I don't try to live a righteous life, I'm not doing enough, you know, because he's he's burned it down several times, you know. Oh, yeah. So, like, oh, I, yeah. I, I he went to prison. To and it, it was like super important for me to see people like that early on, you know. You know, Pete Townsend is sober, you know, like, however they do that is, you know, less consequential to the fact that they're, you know, because when you're getting fucked up, there, there's a part of you that's like still convinced that that's the only way you can create that some part of your muse is connected to yeah. using yeah. which is just like a total fallacy totally you know? it's that keith richards mythology well, he's, he's like the only guy who can do it somehow yeah. you know or, yeah you know maybe maybe it benefits you to a certain extent at a certain time but just yeah uh, it was a very clear uh negative aspect on my life oh it's awful you know but. it's awful and also the amount of high i get from walking on stage sober oh yeah and getting this energy it doesn't even come close yeah. to the cocaine well and i knew that while i was using yeah. too and that's why i would get fucked up after the show because i'd want to keep that feeling going, right you know because right. nothing compares to that no but no. um you know, back to your point of like remembering those like humble, like humbler times is like I have my uh, my UPS name tag, my UPS store name tag on oh. my fridge. So, like this little magnetic thing I used to wear. Yeah. You know, at the counter. Yeah. And I just like that's always on my fridge at home. Like, all right. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got a, I got a, a photo of the last day I worked at the I'm motorcycle the shop. UPS store, and you know, yeah, we're doing all right. And like, that's it. You see it? And it I, you know, that was a good gig too. You know, that was an important gig for me to have too. But I'm, uh, I'm happier doing this. I walk around and I see people working construction in the morning, and I'm like, oh, that's that's what I did. Swinging a hammer, man. Swinging a hammer in the fucking sun, commuting for an hour in traffic. It's good bread, but it's, you know. Yeah, but man, your fucking body's beat takes up. Takes it out of you. Dude, yeah. your hands are all fucked, and you, at the end of the day, you're like, now I got to go rehearse, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Fuck. Having energy for anything after that, after working any sort of Labor. day gig. You yeah. Because I, uh, I was a telemarketer, like, after I was working at the UPS store. And I was doing that for, I think I had that gig for maybe eight or nine months. And I'd be, you know, smiling and dialing, making like 300 phone calls a day. Shit. And like, you know, people just fucking hate you. I hate you. <laughs> and so like, I'd be calling like businesses. Just like, hey, uh, uh, can I speak to the owner of the business? It's like, hey, motherfucker, did you go to did you go to college for this? I hope to God you didn't go to college for this, man. <laughs> like, you'd make more money swinging a hammer. And I'm just like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. Like, I am a piece of shit. What were you <laughs> slinging, toner? No, man, we were slinging. It was like a debt consolidation service. Oh fuck! It was it was pretty gnarly. That's um, the worst because you're calling somebody and they're already. You've gotten some they're credit reports. Yeah. yeah. So you know they're already fucked. And so, now you're calling them going, hey, look, dude. we can not cons- a debt collector. Yeah. We can consolidate <laughs> your debt. Yeah. It was, oh, fucking I mean, man. Uh, yeah. And, and, and cold calls is the worst. The you one- ever get one now? You're like, I don't answer the phone ever because of the, all the AI scams and everything. Yeah. But once in a while, they've got it down now where it just shows like your friend's name. <laughs> You're like, oh, Neil's calling. Hello? Oh, shit. Hi, hi Dean? That's like, fucked up. Oh, it's fucked. Because I have, the shit calls I get are all from the same area code oh, yeah. I grew up in. Yeah. Or if I'm out here for long enough, it'll start calling from an 818 or yeah. like a 323 yep. area code. And you think it might be like a, a you know. A, a and it has someone's name, You like you're saying, yeah. you know. Yeah, it doesn't say scam likely. I see one that came up and it said fucking... I don't know how they do that. It was a shit. comedy club. Yeah. I was like, yeah, You got to take that call. <laughs> yeah, you got to take it. Yeah. And then it's fucking a scam. <laughs> oh, my God. Fucking life is crazy. I don't know, man. It's about to get weirder. Now, do you... <laughs> I know. You, you don't have to tell me about it. I shudder. It. Yeah, it <laughs> is about to it. get weirder. Yeah. Now, while you're working on the record right now, are you thinking about artwork for the album cover? Because you, you release vinyl. Yeah, I mean, 
tell you the truth, no, I haven't thought shit about artwork um, or even really an album title just because I've been so focused on completing all this material and we haven't even chosen what's going to finally make the record yet. Oh, yeah. So that's going to probably determine a lot of like, you know, the packaging and what I want to name the whole project and everything, you know. How are you going to pick the tunes? Are you going to have like people listen like friends and go, oh, I like this song? I mean, I've already, I already know what horses are kind of the favorites right now. Yeah. But I always open it up to collaboration. You know, the band's definitely going to hear it and I appreciate their input um, more than almost anybody. But, um, you know, my manager is another trusted person. And then I've got several, you know, musician friends around the country that I share things with and probably you and yeah you know kick some stuff your way and how about rival sun style they did a lot of songs and then they released two records in a year like the 70s see I want to do that kind of shit yeah and like I'm kind of inspired by watching bands like King Giz oh yeah you know, like they're releasing something every two months it's crazy right which is nuts but like I kind of see how they can do it it's like if you've got your own studio rig and you know how to use it and you're a slam and band, yeah. It's not like instead of like a rehearsal, it's like, okay, I've got a song, call the guys, we come in, we cut it in a day, bam, Put it out. it's in the can. Yeah. You know, and then you send it to the mixing engineer rather than this like process which I've been adhering to for the last five years, which is like, okay, I'm writing the song in my apartment. Then I make a demo. Then, you know, we book the recording session months down the line. We show up for the recording session and there's all this pressure because you're spending so much bread. Yeah. And then, like, you know, you're recording this, you're, you're re-recording the song and you're trying to capture some of the magic that may have been on the demo, too. Which yeah. Is so that's another thing, man. That's another thing. Like it's demo-itis is crazy. Yeah, that's Especially for this record, too, because yeah. I've got some that I, I was, like, so stoked on, like, the demos. And, you know, I'm in the studio. I'm like, oh, we, we got to do it like this because it was, like, the demo. And I'm just, like, hearing myself do this thing that's so stupid, which is just, like, why are you, <laughs> like, you're just so stuck in... Uh, it's a mind fuck, man. Demo itis is so real, man. Yeah. I mean, it's so real that a lot of bands eventually use the demos on some of the records exactly. and remix them and, yeah. and add stuff to them because that original fire and that original of no no pressure. Yeah. Because you're like, well, I was just tracking that in my house. You deliver and a great performance sometimes. Totally. That way, totally. That's a lot with comedy, too. You write jokes, sometimes spontaneous on stage. Those are great jokes. Yeah, and then you go to do them a couple of weeks later, and they're not as good. Yeah, because it was just so in the moment and organic. It's it's crazy because that that happens in every single medium or or like aspect of art that I've tried to engage in. Like when I was in architecture school for example i would do a sketch and then trying to turn it into the real thing is like i would really like this sketch and it would look brilliant etc and then like you spend so much time trying to like clean it up but also capture the the energy of the original you know off the cuff thing and i think there is something in the um to be said about that the unconscious being involved in the creation of the initial um whatever it is demo yeah. You know, and like it goes, that goes back to, you know, Carl Jung, just like there's something being accessed in that moment, you know, where it's not being forced, it's just coming through. And that's like where the real stuff that we can all get connected to, that's the real sauce, you know? That's the real shit, man. It, when you're not sitting down going, okay, let's do it. Yeah. It's just when you're just sitting there, like organically working on stuff, that's. That's like, uh, you know, where all the songs come from. Mm -hmm. You're just strumming away or playing on the keys and, uh-oh, oh, shit, Catch something happened. Thing. Same with the jokes. Yep. It was that famous thing. I was telling somebody, like, I, can't, I can't even believe it. Fucking, this joke just came out of nowhere. Yeah. And then the guy goes, well, don't they all? Yeah. all? And I was yeah. like, he's right. Yeah. You don't just sit down and go, I'm writing a joke. No. I mean, the the joke technician type of one-liner guys or or the late night people they're doing that 
But when you're really just up there finding it and it comes out, it's like, wow. So do you like, for your process, are you throughout the day just writing everything down, making voice memos and just like kind of doing it as you go along or like? I just kind of like, as I'm living my life, like recently I went to a Benny Hanna's yeah, yeah. and I hadn't been since the nineties. <laughs> yeah. Oh shit. And then it's just an engulf of like, Oh, here's a ton of jokes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? That's why uh, there's so many like airplane jokes probably. Yeah. You know, we're yeah. always on the road. You know? But it's mostly just kind of, you know, you see something and you, you put the bullet points in your phone. Like, let's just see here. I got my phone here. I just write something down in the notes, you know, um, and then I go back to it and go, well, what is this? You know, read it in the New York times. Yeah. Yeah. I put that in there because I, I think that you can just say any bullshit <laughs> to somebody at a party. <laughs> just add that. And yeah. you add that and then they believe it. You yeah. go like, yeah, you know, like fucking water is bad for you. It turns <laughs> out and they go, what? You go, yeah, I read it in the New York times. Yeah. And then they go, oh, well that, you know, New York times has all this weight. So they just now you can just full be full of shit. Yeah, because it was quote unquote in the New York Times. That's like in uh, Doctor Strange Love at the end, where he's, he's asking like the Russian spy how he found out about the uh, Doomsday device, and he's like, "Our source was the New York Times." Yeah, that's <laughs> that's it. You know what I mean? It, and it's so fucking real. So that look, I just put that in the phone, read it in the New York Times. So. You know, then I'll go on stage and I'll be like, uh, you know, I feel you can just these days, especially you can just say any bullshit. Well, that's uh, dude. there's so much bullshit out there. Though. It's so much it's bullshit. scary. And, and they're not reading the New York Times. Yeah. I mean, they might be, but those well, people. You know, you know what I realized? You know it, who I'm talking about. They're not yeah. reading the New York no, Times. No, I fucking no. wish they were. <laughs> no, you wish they were. But that's a libertard paper. Yeah. <laughs> it's libertards at New York Times. It's fucking weird, man. It's, uh, and I even get, I, I found myself caught twice this week being caught with clickbait. And I was, you know, eating breakfast with someone. I was like, yeah, well, such and such. And they're like, nah, that's not true. And I realized, oh, I'm fucking an idiot here. Because I just read a clickbait and then didn't dive in. Well, you'll be on the New York Times yeah. app or website. Yeah. And there will be some, like, you know, paid clickbait yeah. shit. Now you got to see it. And yeah. it's like... That's You've, like a real like meta moment, man. It's that's just, a like, crazy. You really fall down a rabbit hole there. That's what happens, and that's, that's kind of why I'm just like I have to. I'm usually pretty careful about what I read, man. And yeah. you know, like we were talking about at lunch, and like you know, I read a couple different like periodicals, and you know, and then I just like read old fucking literature, and you know, I don't know, just. I think if you read both sides, you know, and then just fucking look down the middle, yeah. like this is some bullshit, yeah. and these guys have some bullshit, yeah. and you got to just kind of decipher what, I mean... Yeah, I, who knows what's really going on? I'm floored <laughs> by... When I was growing up, if you printed something uh, that was a lie, yeah. you'd get sued. Like yeah. the, the National Enquirer got sued all the time. <laughs> All the time in the 70s. It'd be like, hey, that didn't happen. We're suing you for well, $2 million. They're still going, man. They're, they're still, still selling going. that shit at the grocery store. They're the originators of just clickbait. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah, they exactly. invented clickbait, yeah. these fuckers. Yeah. And now you can just say whatever you want and it could be total lies and there's no repercussions. Yeah. I don't know. Isn't that crazy? It seems like it's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like we can write some lyrics about it today. Jesus. You know what I mean? It, it's fucking, it, it's a crazy world, man. It really is. So you're out here recording the record, and is this the record or demos or both? This is the record. Wow. I'm making the record right now. Wow, that's cool. Um, the demos are already in the can. Yeah. And like you were saying, some of those might make the record just, you know, with right. new, new vocal pass or whatever. Um, but yeah, you know. Got like 18 songs I'm working with. Is it a different vibe from the last couple? It's all over the place, man, which is kind of a, a challenge, right? Right. Because there's, there's a part of me that desires like 
you know, let's make this coherent. Let's make this like a thread sense. Right. Or is it just like, well, these are the ones that I like the best and they're kind of all over the map. And then I was just thinking about like parliament, a bunch of records in the seventies that, you know, one song is like an old kind of like vaudeville tune. And then there's like this weird, like classical experimental thing that Bernie Worrell is just doing instrumental. And then there's like, a couple funk bangers and then there's like a straight up rock tune you know <laughs> yeah. and so i'm like well if george clinton you know one of the greatest geniuses in music can get away with it then you know who's yeah. to say well what's cool about that is you're gonna get different people they're gonna i love i love the funk stuff and the other guy's like i like this fucking weird psychedelic shit yeah and the I'm other person's like those. i like the soul ballads right right i'm not afraid to dabble in any of those and i've also like i've also got some stuff that's not going to come out in this record but um you know we did a remix we had a this like og um legend of chicago house music uh Derek carter he remixed our song bunny love um and we released it as a 12 inch 45 and so like i'm really into um you know, I've I've been creating things with like drum machines and sequencers. You know, still in the analog workflow. Um, you know, still very much, you know, true to my oeuvre, whatever. And uh, but just like a completely different sound. And so, you know, I'm interested in maybe releasing some of that material separately after this. But yeah, it's it's like the the stuff I'm working on now spans all the way from like hard rock to like kind of like pub disco you know like ian dury and the blockheads or like the clash almost killer and then there's like some straight up you know like parliament you know riff funk kind of stuff you know so it's all over the map and then there's like you know some shit that's like kind of like steely dan or something oh yeah <laughs> speaking my language yeah you know <laughs> i know you love steely dan <laughs> Oh, you FM. played Red that Rocks. Song, FM, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, FM. I told you that was my song. Yeah, yeah, I didn't like, even know that was a movie. I gotta God, know. you uh, played Red Rocks uh, since I had talked to you. I remember I was I was uh, going to try to fly out and sing uh, Nazareth. Oh, dude, we son, still got to do that. We got to do that, yeah. son of a bitch. Yeah. Oh, Hair of the dog. Hair yeah. of the dog. That, yeah. You kill that. <laughs> That'd be so fun. Red Rocks is magic, huh? So cool, man. God, who'd you play it with? Primus. Shady Graves. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, Fuck. we did do that tour with Primus. That was that was rad. Um, but that that was like the Shaky Graves run, and they're sick. Um, super nice dudes. Um, but yeah, that was that was a great, great concert. How great are Primus, man? Oh, dude. Um, you know, I was most aware of Primus and all of Les Claypool's bands in college when my roommate Tommy was like always playing that shit, you know, you know, while we were smoking weed. Yeah, <laughs> just of course. Like, of course. This shit is wild. And you'd be playing like these music videos that they used to make in the nineties were just yeah. like so gonzo and like scary, you know, oh, they kind of yeah. had this like, like psychedelic, but like a bad trip kind of vibe. Yeah. Like, like race car driver, you know, you know like it's lacquer just like head or you weird know. fucking, um, uh, you know, uh, fisheye lenses, yeah, and man. in and out, and animation. Yeah, it was, it's almost it, like a weird speed high. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, um, you know, that was like the impression I had, and then um, what these guys went out with, it was Sean Lennon. Oh God, and, I love it. And um, Les Claypool. That delirium. That shit is. That shit is my favorite. Yeah, I mean. You know, they incorporated some of the, that material. They did some Primus stuff, and then they played, oh, animals, animals oh, fuck by Pink yeah. Floyd I in to its see entirety. That. Oh, and it was like to a T. You know, every sound uh, because Harry Waters, who's uh, Roger Waters' son, he's in the was band playing keyboards. Yeah, yeah, because his son, his dad fired him. <laughs> yeah, well. I don't know. He oh, kicked him oh, out. Oh, yeah, that's right. Now Robert Walters is playing keys with him. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Harry had it dialed, 
And it was just like, and that was so important to that material too, because there's all those synths and everything. But we got to watch that every night, and it was like, it was just that was a really fun time because those are all like really cool rooms too. You know, we played the um, what I remember is the Masonic Temple in uh, Detroit. It's like those old Masonic temples are sweet, man. Oh, I just love like those. Such beautiful buildings. It was like this huge building from the 20s. We did one with Marcus yeah. in San Fran. That remember that? Remember really the cool lobby? Too. Yeah, it was oh so beautiful. Oh, my God. So beautiful. beautiful. Right. They don't make them like that anymore. But um, that was a really great tour. We did this one show that was on a rotating stage. It was like an old dinner theater it's probably like an 1800 cap, maybe 2000. It was like out on Long Island. And uh, the whole stage rot- rotated. Oh, shit. So it's like, you know, moving along. And, you know, I think it made like one circulation every half hour or something. Yeah, they had one of those where I grew up uh, called Circle Star Theater. Okay. And, and it was between San Jose and San Francisco. That sounds about right. And yeah. like, I saw Jerry Seinfeld there, you know? Oh, yeah. And so throughout the show, you know, at one point you're just looking at his ass. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know, Frank Sinatra would play this fucking place. Yeah, man. And it was famous, man. Yeah. Those are cool, right? Yeah, it was really cool. I, I loved the vibe. I and mean, it actually sounded really good in there too i don't know how that worked out but well man it was great to see you again i'm glad you're out here and uh i'm looking forward to hearing this new record i know it's going to be a long time that's the process of yeah. waiting to get it out but uh in the meantime um i'm looking forward to hear how bonnaroo goes yep. if you're going to bonnaroo people make sure you go see neil francis francis comes alive it's the only time he's going to do it again and follow him on Instagram, TikTok, and you got a website. You got a TikTok, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, website. Neil Francis with an A, N-E-A-L, and uh, neilfrancis.com. Yeah, and uh, you can find me. good to see you. And, uh, I, love, I, I love this friendship that we have because we randomly get to see each other. Like, I'm home from the road. You're here making yeah. a record in L.A. Yeah. And, you know, I saw you... Um, we, you and I ate lunch at all time, I don't know, six months ago, a year yeah. ago or something. That was great. It was pouring fucking yeah. rain. And then, you know, the tour and, and just all this long period of, uh, of seeing each other randomly, yeah, which man. is great. So uh, congrats on your success. And uh, I can't wait to Likewise, hear the new man. shit. Yeah, I'll send it your way. All right, guys, everybody, uh, go follow Neil and go listen to his other records and check out Francis Comes Alive and uh, spread the word, man. It's, it's just getting bigger and bigger. See you guys. Candles lit.